Giving all praise and honor to our Father in heaven who created us, hallowed be his name. Father Abba has allowed us to understand his sacred calendar. And in this video, we want to tell you guys how this sacred calendar works. Now, when it comes to our Father's sacred calendar, he tells us about his calendar in Genesis chapter 1, actually, starting at about verse 14. But one thing is really interesting when you look at the flow of Genesis and how he created each thing on each day. You see that this calendar that he was talking about in chapter one, he created on the fourth day, right before he created the living creatures on the earth on the fifth day and then man on the sixth day. But then you see it comes back to it on the seventh day when he starts talking about the Sabbath day. And that's really interesting because, you know, that's one of the uh, first rules of the Bible is related to the Sabbath day. So all that to say that understanding how the sacred calendar works, you know, because our Messiah, when you look back in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, he did his miracles on the Sabbath day um, and feast days. So let's go on to our source text, which for today's class will be coming out of the first book of Enoch, which a lot of people call Enoch the prophet. Again, this is the first book of Enoch. And I did want to show you the first chapter and first verses of first Enoch um, because of how it says that it's written for our time. Um, this is actually the first book ever written on the planet. Enoch was actually taught to write by the angels um, and uh, what to write by those same angels. But he appears to be writing for our time. Now, the text that we're going to reference verse by verse, line by line, is coming from chapter 71 of First Enoch. This is the book of the revolutions of the luminaries of heaven. Um, this is what Enoch was taught from the archangel Uriel. Um, you see all the things he tells him, uh, classes, uh, powers, periods, names, places, progressions. I mean, a lot of this we're going to cover in this video, but we're not going to cover it all. We're going to cover just chapter 71 in this video. Praise our Father in heaven, and um, then we'll be covering chapter 72 all the way through to the end of this book. I think it's about at least five chapters um, till we get to the end of uh, the the uh, revolutions of the luminaries and how they work. You see, you know, he's got a lot to cover here. You see all of this in here. So the first part that he talks about is the sun. So you have the what he says in verse 2 it says the first law of the luminaries this is the first law of the luminaries the next chapter 72 we just talked about that'll be the second law of the luminaries and it'll be talking about the moon but in this one we're going to learn about the sun and the gates you see where he's saying uh, that there are gates on the east and gates on the west and then he says that the first law of the luminaries is that the sun arrives on the western gates. So the first law is like you see our representation of the sun here um, is on the west side here. So the first law of the luminaries is that the sun sets. And that's important to understand is that what it's telling us is that the day ends with sunset. Night is actually the beginning of the 24-hour period. Uh, that's when we get a new 24-hour period. I don't want to say a new day because uh, for a lot of people, the day starts with sunrise. And one thing we have to understand is the evening comes before the morning. Those are the same part of the same 24-hour uh, period, um, night and day. It's just that the night comes before the day. Darkness always comes before light. And that's important to understand in order to get our feast days correct. But 
like you said, the importance of this chapter is these gates. So you have these gates that Enoch is going to talk about, and you have the sun arriving in the western parts of these gates. All right, so let's go on to verse 3 of chapter 71. Again, he's telling us about the sun sets. You know, this is two times that he's pointing out that the sun sets first. This is important to understand that the beginning of the 24 hour period known as the day, which includes day and night, it starts with the night. It starts in the evening with sundown. Then verse four is talking about, again, these gates. But this time it's saying that the moon and the sun both transverse these gates. They both use the same gates. And then he's talking about the stars there. Those make up the three elements of our father's sacred calendar, the sun, the moon, and the stars. But notice here how he's calling the stars conductors. This would be because the stars are not moving. It is the sun and the moon which seem to be moving between these gates, oscillating between these gates. And again, he's telling us that there are six gates. But then look at verse five. He's talking about all of the gates of the solar system. This is what their gates would look like. This is two dimensional, of course, so you have to try to picture it in three dimensions. But like we said, this chapter is all about the gates now he wants to tell us a little about the sun and he does here in verse six um but if we really want to get a clear picture of the sun like for instance where this diagram was created you find out about the great 532 years over in second enoch and we'll cover that in another chapter so we're going to come down here to verse eight which again is telling us that the day, the 24 hour period that includes both the night and the day starts with the night, starts with the evening at sunset. Verse eight says that first the sun sets and then it returns around to the north before it proceeds to the east and enters that certain gate. So all we have to do to picture this is that this sun is going around like this so this view that Enoch is given is from the uh, looking straight down at the poles this would be the North Pole here Enoch is seeing the Sun start here in the West but it's going around towards the north coming back to the east and we are seeing it when it's in the south as it proceeds back towards the west so what he's telling us is that these gates are circular. So they look more like this. But notice how it says that once it comes around towards the east, it is conducted. And the stars, like we talked about earlier, are the conductors. So per the sun's alignment with the stars determines which gate it's in as it illuminates the face of heaven each morning. So verse 10 is telling us that each of these mornings, the sun is going to rise in one of these gates, these circular gates. But when you're looking at these circular gates, which we thought we was looking at something that was more like a clock with degrees included on it. When you look at what they did back in ancient times, looks more like a sundial with a wooden gnomon casting a shadow letting them know which gate they're in, in which part of the year. So whereas some of this stuff could sound extremely complicated, I believe it almost has to be a little complicated when you're explaining something really, really simple. Else you're just wasting your time. So now let's get into these gates. Starting at verse 11, he starts talking about the fourth gate. Now, you remember how many times he has repeated that the day starts at sunset, that sunset is the beginning of all of this cycle. Now, here he's going to do the same thing when he starts talking about the moon and how it is with the sun as it proceeds into this fourth gate. 
And it has to be the first time that it enters the gate. You see right there when it's talking about the first part of it. So you have the sun and the moon together entering these gate at the first part of it. Have you ever heard that sometimes there are 13 months in a sacred year? It seems to be that way. But look right here at verse 11. Notice how it says there are 12 open windows. This was referring to 12 months. From which issue out a flame when they are opened in their proper periods. Now, this is really important stuff. Remember how we said that one of the first things that our father told us about was the Sabbath day. Well, this is what it's talking about here when it's talking about these 12 months, these 12 windows, and how you have a flame that comes out when these windows are open in their proper season. Well, this should bring to mind also Ezekiel 46, 1 through 3, which talks about how on the new moon days, when these windows are open, the gate of the inner court is also opened. So is this what he's talking about, the fire? I believe so. Now, another thing that should be brought out when talking about the sun and the moon preceding it is how we'll see in 72, he'll repeat it in verse 5 when he says, at the time that the moon appears would be the beginning of the months. But we'll save that till we get to that chapter. But I will briefly speak on the Kodesh which we read in the Bible as New Moon or Strong's 2320. What we find out is that there are no new moons in the Bible. The times when the Bible refers to the new moon, it uses the word Kodesh for a new month. So scripturally speaking, new month and new moon are the exact same thing. Well, that's what Enoch was talking about. It's the conjunction of the moon and the sun that determines the months. Not to forget the gates, because remember they have to be in the proper gate. And it is only the first time in that gate that counts. Which brings into question, is there a 13th month at all? We must understand that the day ends at sunset. We also must understand that the month ends with the 0% moon or what our Gregorian calendars refer to as the new moon. And just in case you almost caught that, when your wall calendar says new moon, it's actually talking about the end of the sacred month. So you can start looking for the sliver of the next moon in order to start your new moon. So let's get into these gates now he's going to explain all of these gates and we're not going to go through each one of them but i do want to pay particular attention to the fourth gate or the first window or the first month or first month if as we call it starts talking about that in verse 12. so it's worth noting that we are here at the beginning of the months Remember that URL tell them about the months or the periods. So here we're about to learn about the periods. I shouldn't say months. Because what we're talking about is the sun's position in these gates. He's not really going to talk about the moon's position here. We just have to remember what he said earlier about you have to have the moon in conjunction with the sun in that gate in order to call it a new month being sure that it is the first time that that adjunction occurred in that period. But let's look at this verse. It says, when the sun rises in heaven, so here we're going to be in the east when the sun rises, it goes forth through this fourth gate 30 days. So we're looking over here and we can see these gates here in blue. So what it's saying is the sun will take 30 days to transverse from one blue arc to the next. The sun will rise here and it'll stay in that gate and it'll set in that gate. And it'll take 30 days until it reaches the next gate. So this fourth gate, which will indicate the first period, would be right here in the middle 
And we know that it's in the middle from what the verse says right here. And by the fourth gate in the west of heaven on a level with it descends. So what that's saying is at the same part that it rises over here in the east. That's the same place that it's going to set over here in the west. So it's on a level. It's supposed to be 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. But that depends on your time zone and your position in that time zone and how your clock is set. But just as a note, if you wanted to get on sacred time, then on the day that this is talking about, this will be the equinox, the first day of the year. You would set your clock at six o'clock right at sunset or sunrise and then throughout the year it'll tell you which gates you're in you just have to know but we'll get into that in another class getting a little bit ahead of myself what enoch really wants us to know is that in the first window the first period which is the fourth gate that the sun is going to rise at 90 degrees and is going to set at 90 degrees now in verse 13, just like all of the gates are explained in this way, it starts talking about the period of the day, the length of the day, how long the day is versus how long the night is. And what Enoch is telling us is that it is on this day right here at the beginning of these 12 windows, at the beginning of the year, the day is actually getting longer than the night. And that's important because we have this equinox uh, two times in a year, once in the fall and once in September. But you see in September that the length of the day is getting shorter. On September the 22nd, there's 12 hours and seven minutes in a day. And then a little less than a week later, there's 11 hours and 56 minutes in a day. Whereas in March, you see that the day's increasing by about 12 minutes each day, right around March the 20th. All of this is what Enoch is telling us is how to determine the beginning of the year. You hear people talking about barley harvest this and that. It's never in here going to mention barley harvest. He's actually telling us from scientific means how the calendar is supposed to work. You can take this to any a uh, person of science and they should be able to confirm what we're saying here what he's telling us is that the length of the day is increasing by one part the way enoch explains this there are 18 parts to a day and around the equinox we have even parts 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night and the good thing about explaining it this way is that over the course of these six gates you're going to have an equal number of parts relative to the light versus day so in other words we start off like this on the equinox we just have just as much dark hours as we do light hours but then it changes over the course of 30 days where we have 10 parts day versus only eight parts in the night and it does this for each one of the gates all the way through that was just the first gate but if you want to pause and read you can read through the other uh gates at least 10 of them are included here which says the exact same things breaks down the uh gates and such and when you get it all plotted out it kind of looks like this enoch has given us a biblical description of the alanema and when you put it in a table it kind of looks like this the beginning of the year starts when the Earth's tilt is at zero and the days are getting longer than the nights. Oh, and don't forget the moon. You gotta have the conjunction of the moon and the sun and you get a new month. So what we are to understand about these gates is that they are showing us the sun's position in what's known as the Alanema. If you were to track the position of the sun at high noon over the course of a year, this is the positions that it would appear in in the sky over the course of that year. So if you were tracking high noon using the point of a shadow over the course of a year right at high noon, that shadow would travel around that plane 
just like this. The moon does the same thing, just 12 times faster. It makes the same circuit through the same gates in a month while it takes the sun a year. Well, we'll talk about that in the next chapter. I wanted to bring you down to the last few verses that's talking about these 12th gate because again, it's telling us when this occurs in the year. This is how we know when the year starts is what we learned back up there talking about the sun entering the fourth gate or the first period and here now at the twelfth period or the third gate. You notice here in verse 42 that it's simply saying on that night that the days and the nights will be of equal parts. So if you have the beginning of the fourth gate here, which is around the equinox in March and you start going around clockwise you would find that the 12th window would start off looking like this with less daytime hours than nighttime hours but the days are increasing in that part of the year so at the end of that 12th period the nights and the days will be equal once again and it goes on to say that this year will be precisely 364 days when you count it like such. Now, a lot of people have a problem with the sacred calendar for this very reason that it has 364 days. But one thing you have to understand is that currently today there are over 40 different calendars in the world, all kinds of calendars starting on all different times and having different days in the year. Like, for instance, the Christian calendar, which has 365 and a quarter days in it, while the Muslim calendar has 354 days in it. The most important thing to understand about those calendars and any calendars is how they're calculated. The Christian calendar is a sun based calendar. That's why it has 365 days in it, like you learn in Second Enoch. But it doesn't take into account the moon or the stars like we learn in First Enoch. So that's why there is a such thing as a Gregorian calendar, because as their calendar gets out of sync, it must be updated every so often. Then you have the Muslim calendar, which does consider the position of the moon, but does not take into consideration the sun's position relative to the stars. That's why their feast of Ramadan falls 10 days earlier every year. But there are several other calendars, but surprising that you find is that the Jewish calendar doesn't consider the sun, the moon, or the stars at all in its calculation. The Jewish calendar is actually based off of what they call the Metonic cycle, which was created by the president of the Sanhedrin at the time, a gentleman named Hillel II. He created a table that looks just like this that foretells the times and they use that table in order to predict their months. In other words, they're not looking at the stars, the moon, or the sun at all. They refer back to this table created back during and under persecution from Constantine. This is why their calendar is called a Jewish calendar. It's like the sacred calendar, but they're not using the same methods to calculate it. Anyway, now verse 43 goes on to talk about the day length. In each one of those descriptions of the gates, we were told how the length of the day changes. Well, here in verse 43 is telling us it's because of the progression of the sun, of course. But this diagram from Wikipedia tells us exactly how that's working. Remember how we said the sun was traveling along this alanema? We could use a chart like this to determine how many hours of daylight we should be getting for each part of the year we're in. But now let's go back to something we had talked on a little bit earlier back in verse 11 where it talked about in the first part of it. This I wanted to talk about when it comes to the 13 months. Because the way I understand this, this would mean that there's no such thing as a 13th month. What we read in verse 11 was that one of the 12 windows is opened when the sun with the moon 
enters the gate in the first part of the gate. So if you have a, another conjunction inside of that same gate, is another window open? According to our, the way I read this verse, no, a window would not be opened because one of the 12 windows is opened only with the conjunction of the sun and the moon in the first part of the gate, not in the latter part of the gate. So when you're looking at the 0% moon over the course of 19 years, you start to see where this 13th month goes away. If there's no such thing as a 13th month, then what happens to it? Well, you see in the year 2023, there will be two conjunctions that would create a second Elul. But like we determined earlier, the new window was not opened. So that would actually be a non-month. The same thing in June of 2026, even though there's a new moon on about June the 15th or June the 16th, the month won't start until the sun and the moon converge in the first part of the period that starts June the 19th. So technically, even though we may see 13 moons go by in a 364 day year, there's no such thing as a 13th month because the 13th window is never opened. Okay, so that brings us to verse 45, concluding the law of the sun and how it spends 60 days in each one of these gates. And it talks about how it is named after a particular kind. So I think it is to remind us of the other sun. But if we would, we could get more information about the sun over in second Enoch, also known as the book of the secrets of Enoch. It goes into more detail about the timing of the sun. You can see in those chapters there. But we're going to go on to verse 47, which is the last verse in that chapter. It's talking about these chariots, which we're going to get into a little bit in the next chapter. And you see here that it's saying that, that the sun is on a magnitude of seven times brighter than the, the moon. The size of the moon in comparison to the sun is almost infinite as well, as you can see in this diagram here from UNLV. Verse 47 says that the size of the moon and the sun are equal. This is only apparent because of how precise the size of the sun, the moon, and the earth are in comparison to one another. If you look from the right angle, all three would be the exact same size. But anyway, that concludes chapter 71, which is the first part of the book of the revolutions of the luminaries of heaven. So summing up what we've learned. This simple diagram shows us how the calendar works. First, we see there are six gates, which represent the stars. And when the sun and the moon meet up together in those gates, we get a new month or a new moon. We saw that each season was made up of three moons, one of 30, then 30, then 31 days making a total of 364 days in a year. Now, hopefully this seems pretty simple, but we plan to revisit this diagram as we add more information that we'll learn from the next chapter. Let's go on to chapter 72. Verse one is talking about the law of the inferior luminary, the name of which is the moon. But notice right there how it says that the orb of the moon is which as the orb of heaven. Now, I had to think about this for a while because, first of all, which orb is he talking about? First thought was our atmosphere, but the moon is considered to be in heaven and it is outside of our atmosphere. So the next idea of an orb could only be talking about our universe. Reminding us of the idea of the multiverse. Now, many people have studied the idea of a multiverse, meaning that there are multi-universes, which you can only find on or through other dimensions. But all of that leads to the idea of space-time, 
which is the reason why we're having this conversation in the first place. It is the fact that our universe was created and brought into this dimension does time exist at all. But if you think that's deep, look at verse two, which talks about this chariot blown by the wind is the motor force behind the moon moving across the sky, just like it said the sun was. Well, before you blow this off to be the supernatural, understand that over there in CERN, this is exactly what they're trying to understand and figure out. How has the invisible been made visible? That's the Higgs boson that they're looking for. If they can find that, the Higgs boson and recreate it, they can make it to where we'll all see these chariots pulling the sun and the moon across the sky. All right, so that brings us to verse three, which is talking about how the moon is different every month. And from this little table here below, you can see why it's because we get new moons at different times of the month. So that means there's a different percentage of the month seen. Like for instance, when you're looking at the full moon, that's why a lot of times people make mistakes and claim that a moon is full when it's not. It's because they're used to that slight variation from month to month. But then it goes on to talk about the periods or as the periods of the sun. Now this is where it gets really interesting because by period it's talking about the day of the sun or the day of the moon. Like, for instance, if you were standing on the moon, how long would it be from one sunrise to the next? Now, one of the things you'll want to take note of and study more on is how the moon does not orbit around the Earth. And the way the moon revolves or rotates with the Earth, a day on the moon would be 27.3 days long. In other words, if you were living on the moon, on day one, you would have sunrise. High noon would be about seven days later. And then almost at about day 14, Earth day 14, that is, that's when you will be at sunset on the moon. So only half a day has gone by. And then you're going to be in two weeks of darkness in which the coldest part would be the seventh day or halfway. But then don't worry because seven days from then, you know, you'll have another sunrise. Now the 27.3 days I'm getting from the website lpi.usra.edu. But if you look down, Wikipedia talks about the Kerrigan rotation which determine that the sun's rotation is 27.3 days as well. So if you were living on the sun, you would have a new moon every 27.3 days. Well, like we said, if you were living on the moon, you would have a new sun every 27.3 days. That's what Enoch is talking about when he says that the periods are the same. Also in verse three, it starts talking about the light of the sun versus the light of the moon. It says that the moon's light is one seventh that of the sun. Now, I say again, this is the first book ever written. And we see that Enoch knew that the period of the sun and the period of the moon was the exact same down to 25 thousandths of a day. Let's see how accurate he is when he's talking about the earth being one seventh portion of the sun. Now, I failed to put the website that this information comes from in my notes. It's talking about how the Greek astronomers calculated the ratio of the sun versus the moon. The gist of the article is that the author is concerned that some of the constants used by Hippocrates was arbitrary. In other words, he just made up some numbers. 
I will not argue against that. But if we use his same numbers and or the same method in which he came up with those numbers, we can compare his scale to what Enoch said. I only find it necessary to do so because he says that the sun is 14 times brighter than the moon. When Enoch says that the sun is only seven times brighter than the moon. So we can get a little information from Kogala.com, which tells us that the sun produces 93 lumens of visible light. Then we can go to physicsforum.com and find out that the moon is only 0.3 lumens per meter squared. Well, let's see how accurate the Greek astronomers were when it came to what Enoch said. So, candle power is 12.6 lumen per candle. Enoch calculated it to be 5.4 lumens, or a little less than a half of the candlelight. Whereas the Greek astronomers calculated it to what seems to be way less at three one hundredths of a candle. Well, when you're talking about the brightness of the sun and the moon being one seventh the brightness of the sun, I'm not going to debate plus or minus two fifths of a candle. So let's go on. Now in verse four, it's talking about the rising of the moon at its commencement towards the east. So this is talking about the new moon and how it goes forth for 30 days. Now here's where it gets really interesting because we've been boasting on the accuracy of this book. But here it is saying that the lunation is 30 days when we understand it to be 29.5 days thereabouts. So let's see how all of that works out. The first thing we need to talk about is the sidereal period of the moon. We've already discussed this a little bit back when we were talking about how the moon does not orbit around the earth and how many days it takes for it to go around the sun. Well, the sidereal period of the moon takes into account the position of the moon relative to the stars, not just the sun. But what we find out from those articles like this one from physics.sfasu.edu that the moon travels 12 degrees over a 24 hour period. In other words, if you go out there one evening and look at the moon relative to a star and then come out exactly 24 hours later, you will see that the difference in the degrees between the moon and that same star will be 12 degrees. Now, a month occurs when the moon travels 360 degrees relative to the Earth and Sun. In other words, one new moon to the next will be a 360 degree rotation of the moon. The moon turns 360 degrees per month. So if the moon travels 12 degrees in 24 hours, that means it'll take 720 hours for a whole month. A month is 720 hours. So now if we take a look at a clock, which is 12 hours for every turn or 12 hours per every rotation of the hour hand, 720 hours will be 60 turns of the hour hand. So 60 turns of the hour hand is a moon. Now I say this gets real interesting because we can actually demonstrate this on a clock. We could take any old clock which is already showing us hours, 12 hours per turn, we just need for that clock to count out 60 turns. Well, that's what the clock is doing already, isn't it? Multiplying by 60, 60 revolutions of the second hand is a minute, 60 revolutions of the minute hand is an hour. What this is telling us is that 60 revolutions of the hour hand is a month or a lunation. So that's what we did. We put two clocks together to create what we call the celestial clock calendar. 
This was the very first one here. We actually got it put together on February the 22nd. And we haven't touched it since. Today is April the 25th. And we can see how accurate it has been over the time. You see right here, we have the clock that we got finished. Like we said, we got it built and set on February the 22nd of the year 2022, 2222. And no doubt it was 1022. I got it in my notes. So this appears to be what the clock looked like set in February compared to the current time. It's an hour off. That would be because of daylight savings time. This clock on the top is set. Um, it doesn't take into consideration daylight savings time, just like the moon does not. And it's also a day off because we failed to add the day during the day of remembrance that passed back there in March. Other than that, everything else seems to be lining up just perfectly. But for demonstration purposes, we'll use this one here. This is the Celestial Clock Calendar that we make and sell through the bombintheblend.com. That's a herbal tea shop where you can get your herbs and other inspirations inspired by our Father. Y'all pop on over there and check out that channel. There's always free shipping when you order a clock. But let me show you now how this clock is used as a visual aid to understand how the celestials work. All right, so first, let's come over to this table I created from the new moon data of the year 2022. Because somebody's going to point out that the lunation is only 29.5 days and it doesn't work out to exactly 60 turns of the hour hand. So let me show you really quickly how this all works out. If you look at the month of January 2022, you see that the moon completed its lunation about 13 hours before the sun did. And you see in February, it was the same case, about 12.97 hours between one new moon and the next. And in March, it was almost 15 hours. Well, by then, the moon, it is ahead of the sun by over a day, 40 hours. Now, the lunations do vary throughout the year, as you can see. Sometimes getting down to as little as six hours variance between the month and the moon. You see that over the course of the year, this adds up to about four days. 133 and a half hours. So here is a discrepancy and a brand new age old debate. Which one is correct? The sun or the moon? Well, we're going to learn in subsequent chapters that the moon is actually in charge of regulating time, not the sun. The sun has its job giving warmth and energy to the earth. But when it comes to time, the moon is the regulator. So to make up for these four days, we have four days added to the calendar, which makes up the 364 day calendar. Now, if you're looking closely here, you see that I have 32 hours instead of 24 hours, because it turns out that there is a day and eight hours added each quarter. But the way this works is this day and a quarter is added to the calendar every three months. And at the end of the year, you see that we're left with about 5.52 hours. And that's how you end up with 365 and a quarter Sundays, 352 lunar days, and 364 sacred days. All right, so now let's see how all of this works. We're gonna get down to the nuts and bolts of this thing. And from this table, you can see already that it's gonna get 
a tiny bit complex. Well, praise our Father in heaven, we have this clock to help us to understand how all of this works. Let's set it back to the first day of the first month in the year 2022. Just like we said, this is not an ordinary clock. We've actually combined two clocks together. This will be clock's daddy. I'm going to talk about his granddaddy in the next chapter. But anyway, what you're used to being the second hand now represents the hour hand. That's why it's pointing to the six, representing sunset back there in April. Then you have the minute hand, which is set to the lunation or the month. It's set to the new moon to begin the cycle. And then you have the hour hand, which represents the stars. It's pointing to April the 1st or April the 2nd, which was the date of the new moon in the year 2022. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this clock and we're going to step through this table and see how all of this plays out. So just like the clock, we're starting here on April the 2nd at 6 p.m. in the year 2022 where everything is reset to zero. The seasonal days, which is 91 days, is set to zero. The periods, which are about 31 days, is set to zero. That would be in this column. Of course, this column is the date according to the Jewish calendar. And in these columns, you have the lunations. This will be an important column as we look at the periods that the clock is ticking off. The turns of the clock will be represented by this column. It will take two turns to make a day. That's why over here you have AM and PM. And this column over here represents the lunation. The 0% moon is not seen here because the 0% moon occurred in the AM. So those 12 hours have passed till we see it in the PM. So we're already starting off with a 0.5 day variation or 12 hours difference. But anyway, let's step through this and let's see how it works. The moon is the regulator, so let's pay attention to the moon as we step down through here. We're looking here at Nisan 1. Let's scroll all the way down till we get to IR 1. And it appears that it's perfect timing. You have the end of the 60 lunations falling on IR 1 on May the 2nd. So that's not a problem. Let's keep stepping through to the next month. And while doing so, I should remind you what's going on in this column right here. These are the 30, 30, and 31 days. Well, since we're entering the second month, there is no 31st day. But when you look over here at our lunations, you see that the discrepancy is getting bigger. There's actually a day difference now between what the clock says and what the moon says. All right, so let's see how this looks. I think you'll be amazed at how accurate all of this really is. And I have to give you know credit to our Father in heaven. L let me just show you how it works. Okay, so we're here, like we said, on April the 2nd of the year 2022. This would be the beginning of the year, the first day of the first month. But like we talked about, the new moon was in the a.m. So what we have to understand is that 12 hours has already passed by the time we get to this point. So whereas my moon hand is sticking straight up to the 12, I need to go forward 12 hours. And you'll see why in a second here. So let me go ahead and do that. But there you see what it looks like as we've gone 12 hours ahead. That's 12 hours difference. All right, so in the second month, it'll look like this, whereas the hand was just a little bit ahead starting the first month. Now it's hitting right dab in the middle on the second month. Let's see what happens on the third month. So there's the second month, IR1. Let's scroll down to CVAN1, which should start somewhere around May the 31st. Now you start to see a discrepancy you see that the clock will indicate the new month down here around June the 1st, which appears to be two cycles behind the new moon. 
So the clock will look more like this. So now we can see that we're starting to get off a little bit. Our clock appears to be a day behind. And the table matches such. But we haven't met the day of remembrance yet. So let's go another month. So here we're here at Cyber 1. Let's scroll down to Tammuz 1. Now you start to see some color start to come on the screen. It's because of the day of remembrance that we see right here for the first time we get to see the 31st day. But as far as our illumination is concerned, we see that we are still three clicks off. So that's what two clicks off looked like last month. So that's about what two clicks looks like off in the third month in the year 2022. So therein comes the day of remembrance to make this match up again, because remember that the lunation is pointing to the new moon and you can't change the moon. What we have to do in order to rectify the problem is add a day to the calendar. We have to add a day to make this up. So let me show you what this looks like. So there you have us, what appears to be about a day behind. So what we have to do in order to adjust and rectify our man-made calendar is to move ahead by a day. And that's how we add the four seasonal days to the calendar. That's why we have four seasonal days. So the way this works is you come down to the 31st day, the day of remembrance. But just like on the clock, we had to move the hands forward to create the new day. On this spreadsheet table to create a new day, all I do is shift the cells up for that period about the day of remembrance. For this case, it was two cycles. Well, watch what happens in the future. Two cycles was equivalent to one day. Well, we get down here to September the 30th and we see the movement we did three months earlier, but we also see that it's necessary to do it again, but this time it's necessary to move it two days. But let's scroll back up because you remember that they weren't adding 24 hours, but they were adding 32 hours. So instead of deleting two cells, we'll delete three cells. Now let's scroll down and look, look. We see that we are off by one, two, three cells. So on the day of remembrance here, we add one day, eight hours and eight minutes by deleting these three cells. When we get down to the next day of remembrance, we see how our calendar is straightening it out. And when we get back around to March the 23rd, we see there's a half a day difference or a 12 hour difference. That's going to account for the 0.25 days. And those will be made up in the fourth year. These days, these four days we're going to learn are extremely important. These are the days of remembrance that's talked about in the book of Jubilees. Now we understand how these angels have added these days to the calendar to ensure that we are on the correct time every year and keep our seasons and feast days lined up correctly. We'll do that more when we talk about the angels that added these days. We're going to go on to verse 5, which is talking about in a time in which the moon appears and becomes to you the beginning of the month. This is talking about the new moon. See how it says when it appears? You have to remember that on the technical new moon, the 0% new moon, it is completely invisible. So now that it is appearing again in what we call the sliver of the waxing crescent moon, that becomes to us the beginning of the months. And you see there Strong's number 2320, which talks about the word Kodesh, which really means month. So according to the Bible, the new moon is the new month, just like Enoch said it was. Then it says 30 days it is with the sun in the gate from which the sun goes forth. But see, as we look at this picture from wikipedia.org, we have to remember the conversation we had 
about how the moon does not orbit around the earth. It rotates with the earth as they orbit the sun. It's like that moon is on a tractor beam locked into a certain position relative to the earth. And if it wasn't for the earth spinning on its own axis, anybody living on the moon would always see the same side of the earth. And people on the other side of our planet would never get to see it. All that to say that the lunar orbital inclination does not change. So what's changing? The earth. The same tilt of the earth that causes the seasons causes the moon to change gates along with the sun. So that's why no matter what time of the year we're in, the path of the moon is the same as that of the sun. They're both in the same gate. Now, the next verse is talking about how the moon receives its light. He's saying that half of the moon is seven portions or the whole moon is 14 portions. Well, that should remind you of how the period of the moon is 27.3 days, almost exactly four sets of seven days, four periods of 14 days. Well, over those 14 days, we see the moon acquire a portion of his light per day. Now, you have to remember that in the previous verse, he was talking about at the time that it appears. So he's talking about the new moon. Well, here in verse six, he's describing the new moon, saying that at the beginning, it was completely void of light. But on this day, it receives a seventh portion of the light. It says that on a new moon that it's going to receive one seventh of its light. That's the crescent moon that we've been talking about. So on this day, this new moon day, you see it saying that this is the day in which the moon sets with the sun. Now, to understand what's going on here, all we have to do is look at this diagram from acetufts.edu, which shows the true rotation of the moon in relationship to the earth and the sun. Well, what you see is the earth and the moon rotate in a clockwise motion. While the earth is spinning, everybody on the planet gets to see the moon in the same phase. It's because like we said, the moon is rotating every 27.3 days, while the earth is spinning on its axis every 24 hours. Okay, so let's continue to learn how this new moon works. Now, verse seven starts to tell us the specific day that the new moon will occur. This chart that we're looking at is for the new moon around April the 30th. So let's look back at this table of the metonic cycle to see when the new moon should have occurred. Now, since this is looking at the 0% moon, we'll come to the year 2022 and come down until we see the new moon around April the 30th. And we see that the 0% moon would have occurred at 1500 hours on April the 30th. So we come back to our table so we can get a quick understanding of this using our lunations. 1500 hours on April the 30th would be considered the AM because the new moon can only be seen in the PM. And from the time of the 0% moon occurrence to the time that it can actually be seen is a little over 24 hours. So that takes us to the earliest possible confirmation of the sliver of the new moon would be around 1500 hours or May the 1st. But of course, we won't be able to see it until sunset. That means that we should have had confirmation of the new moon on May the 1st. Now, again, this portion of the table here is the Jewish calendar, which we talked about earlier, relies on a metonic cycle and not the visible confirmation. But when we come to the website moonsighting.com, we can see that the earliest authentic reporting of the new crescent moon was on May the 1st in Bridgetown, Barbados. So we know that the new moon was on May the 1st. So let's see how Enoch is being told that it works. Now, this is a bit confusing. So let me jump ahead and take a peek at verse eight because he's actually talking about the day previous to the new moon in verse seven, just like he is in verse eight. 
You see in verse 8 how he's talking about the sun sets with the moon. We see that in April the 30th. Well, it is the same April the 30th that is being talked about in verse 7 when it's saying that the moon rises with the sun. So this is the previous day. This is the date that that metonic cycle was pointing to as the 0% moon. So when your Gregorian calendar says that there is a new moon, what you can expect on that day is that the sun and the moon will rise at the same time or about the same time. And then according to verse eight, they will set on that same time. See April the 30th, this is the day before the visible confirmation of the moon on May the 1st. So on that night, the 0% moon, just like verse nine says, it sets dark. There is no light in the moon. That's why we call it the 0% moon. But then it says on that day, talking about the next morning, it rises with one seventh portion of its light. So this will be the morning on May the 1st when it's rising with one seventh portion of its light. Since the 0% moon was at 1500 hours the previous day, it will probably receive one seventh portion of that light at 1500 hours on May the 1st. But then it's only after the sun goes down on the evening of May the 1st that they have visible confirmation. And then from that time on, just like the rest of the verse says, the timing between the sunset and the moonset will start to decline from one another, meaning they start to separate. And for the next 14 days, according to verse 10, each day it would receive one portion of light. With the moon being full on the 15th day, well, we're going to find out just like Ecclesiastes chapter 43 verse 7 says, when we see it on the 15th day, it would have already been full and its light is starting to decrease. All right. So what do you think? Those are the first two chapters of the book of the revolution of the luminaries of heaven. And so far we've learned about how the sun and the moon travel through these gates to allow us to tell what season we're in. But this is just part one. Make sure you have your subscription button pushed and that bell notification button pushed so you can see part two when it comes out because it promises to be way more exciting than part one. And in the meantime, you can help get the word out about the calendar by sharing this video. Make a clip of it and share it on your channel or share it on your Facebook account or Twitter. We plan to make this a bigger project even a user's manual for the celestial timepieces of our Father's sacred calendar. And we're going to need help to do so, so I'm asking all of you guys to help any way you can. And you can start by pushing the like button and leaving a comment. And may our Father bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Father lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.